two months, our suspicion is that when we bring these people back at six months or a year, that these lesions will be persistent. So spinal bends can never be ignored. So far, the Navy's research has been on amateur divers. The number of accidents has increased with the popularity of the sport. In commercial diving, accidents are less frequent. Divers are highly trained, and they're supervised according to strict rules laid down by the health and safety executive. But they do still get the bends. With the demands of commercial practice and with improved equipment such as heated suits, they're diving deeper, longer than Hall Day never dreamed of. But though equipment has pushed back the barriers to deep air diving, medical knowledge of its effects has not kept up. The industry has been pushing divers to the limit and nobody knows the consequences. One practice in particular has come under fire. It's a technique that's banned in France, but ironically it's used here because in the North Sea it's safer than decompressing by in-water stops. Holding a fixed level in calm water is one thing, but with a swell of six or more meters it's impossible. And it's near the surface, where pressure on the diver may be halved, that a few meters can mean the difference between safe decompression and serious injury. The technique is called surface decompression. The diver stops once, about halfway up, then he's brought straight to the surface. Light off. On deck, he's already fizzing. He's got five minutes maximum to get out of his gear and across deck to the safety of the pressure chamber to avoid high risk of getting a bend. In the chamber, he's recompressed to 40 feet, shrinking and hopefully eliminating any bubbles that have formed. He's brought to surface in controlled stages, breathing oxygen. Ironically, it's precisely the procedure that's used to treat the bends. Divers hate it. When you come out of the chamber after surface decompression, you feel horrible. You just feel manky and you might be uh, aching slightly. You usually get a niggle at the end of, end of a week and you can get a bend. If you're diving deep for long periods, day after day, um, let's say at the end of a 28-day period, um, you will, for a start, it'll increase your chances of, of, of getting decompression sickness because you'll get a, a residual nitrogen build-up. Um, plus, it, it has a slowly... Um, it deteriorates you very, over a period of time um, and at the end of 28 days you'll start to feel tired, lethargic, coming out the chamber, you'll... It's not good for you. You are actually doing yourself some damage, although they don't know exactly how much. But the doctors do know that it, it doesn't do you any good, but because it's the way that uh, we've been diving for so many years, it's, it's just allowed to go on. And surface decompression can result in bends. It can strike several hours after the diver has left the chamber. He may find himself back inside for treatment. We talked to two divers to whom this happened. They don't wish to be identified by their employers. After I came out of the chamber, we were looking at the records. I was looking at the uh, doctor's report. I'd actually passed out and actually had to be revived. My heart had stopped and I'd stopped breathing. Um, and I do feel as though I was very lucky to come out of it alive. I mean, I didn't really know what was going on, because I just remember waking up in the chamber, 
having needles and drips stuck into me and uh, not feeling very well, and it was quite frightening. It's uh, a blank part in my life. I mean, I remember feeling very worried. I remember being in pain. Um, I remember feeling very ill. Um, but the actual hardships associated with being unconscious, being paralyzed, unable to urinate, so on, um, I, I missed all that. I, I just didn't have my faculties about me. I was given some tests at the Nervous Diseases Hospital in London. I had a nuclear magnetic resonance scan and also revoked potentials, and it did show I did have some damage in my brainstem. So I had actually been advised to stop air diving, because obviously you now I'm quite susceptible. Dr. Philip James is an outspoken critic. I think part of the difficulty is that there has not been medical acceptance of this in principle. Um, the two agencies involved, where doctors in fact meet in order to discuss these matters, the Diving Medical Advisory Committee and the MRC Decompression Sickness Panel, have both failed to come out and say quite categorically that this deep air diving is giving rise to an unacceptable problem. Any cases of decompression sickness must be recorded in the company log, which contains details of every dive. The Department of Energy persuaded contractors to hand over their logs, and a report was compiled on the number of incidents in one dive season. Results were shocking. From records of 25,000 dives, the department concluded, for long exposure dives, there was an unacceptably high incidence of type 2 decompression sickness. All arose from surface decompression. So, in spring 86, the department issued a safety memorandum. Though not strictly binding in law, it set out recommended guidelines cutting the amount of time a diver could stay at depth. It meant that divers working below 40 meters could work only 20 or 30 minutes a day. Dive contractors were up in arms. There was con some concern within the industry on aspects of the report, and in particular that its widespread dissemination was probably premature without further important clinical studies, um, which we felt were necessary to actually round the whole thing off. But in particular, it was looking at incidents of decompression sickness almost in a vacuum, without saying why those incidents had occurred. Claiming their own procedures never led to bends, contractors sought dispensations for longer diving time. The Department of Energy gave those dispensations, which effectively then became like a Pandora's box, because it then brought the whole thing into the commercial arena. And once one company had a dispensation, which effectively allowed them to have longer bottom time. Then another company had to go for a similar dispensation because otherwise they would have been commercially disadvantaged. But last spring, the Department of Energy went further. They withdrew all dispensations. But have they gone far enough? Should surface decompression be banned altogether? As the wife of a diver, I do not believe that a bend should be an acceptable risk of diving. I think that divers should be able to feel safe and should be safe in a decompression chamber which is a controlled situation um, and I feel that the safety standards could still be improved. What people tend to overlook is that divers are still human beings who have families and the loss of one diver's life is a very traumatic experience for the people he loves. And I think that's sometimes overlooked in the, the scrabble to produce oil and gas. But even if bends were eliminated altogether, it wouldn't solve the problem of long-term health effects. Calder found damage in divers who'd never had a bend. With Palmer and neurologist Trevor Hughes, he was using a more sensitive staining technique to study the spinal cords. Rotten tissue shows up clearly as black specks against a healthy yellow background. With this technique, they found extensive damage in apparently healthy young men who'd never had bends or any symptoms. One that stands out, he was a, an air diver all his um, 26 years of his life and uh, had not had an incident at all and he was very well monitored. So young divers are being somehow damaged by routine diving. They're unaware of it because there's some slack in the nervous system. 
To find the cause needs a technique for checking the living diver throughout his diving career. Follow this line here. One way to check up on the nervous system is to look into the eye. It's the window on the brain. Now, Alan, we're now going to inject some dye and then do some pictures. Now, injecting the lights. The eye receives its blood supply from the same blood vessels as the brain. So could it too be damaged by diving? Professor Alan Bird at Moorfields Eye Hospital examined more than 80 divers. Okay, look straight ahead with your right eye. Watch that stick there. Be very still. They used a fluorescent technique to photograph the back of the eye. A detailed count of the tiny capillaries showed changes in over half the divers, including all the professionals. The longer they dived, the fewer the blood vessels. In this one, part of one layer of the retina has been destroyed. Yet, none of the divers have lost any vision. Professor Alan Bird. People who are acutely sensitive have change in the very central part of the vision, the part we use for reading. But in the surround vision, one can lose huge quantities of vision without people being conscious of that, of that being missing. Now, it may be that divers have lost some of their peripheral vision, and we haven't assessed that as yet. It may be that the vision is quite reasonable now, but with age and with cumulative change, that visual loss may become apparent with time. That's excellent. Though eye damage may never affect the diver, this simple test could give early warning of damage to the nervous system and provide a basis for long-term studies of its cause. At his research centre near Plymouth, Maurice Cross has concluded that bubbles are not the only cause. I think the prime candidate for causing trouble in diving has got to be the blood. We've got evidence in this laboratory that red cells become stiff and that white cells seem to undergo some sort of change. Uh, not during decompression, on the contrary, when they're exposed to pressure. So some of the damage of diving might actually be caused by going diving rather than by coming back from it. To test how these blood cell changes may be affected by the gas they breathe, engineering students have volunteered to go under pressure for six days. Inside. Okay, commence pressurization. They'll breathe a mixture of helium and oxygen. It gives them their squeaky voices and check their blood at various depths down to 110 meters. At the moment you're at about six meters, you'll be carrying on to about 10 meters, and then we'll be doing a stop and an O2 make up again. Hold, stop at 15. Tests begin at 15 meters. When blood cells become stiff, they could act like plugs, as bubbles do, blocking blood vessels and starving tissue in bones and nervous system. Maurice Cross wants to know if these effects can be reduced by breathing heliox instead of air. Oh, that's fine. How's the scalp bleed done? Uh, they seem to be going well, actually, Maurice. Um, no problem. No problem at all there. Uh, scalp bleed is definitely. Uh, biochemistry techniques for engineers. <laughs> and it's hardly refined, but the Stabley test measures the time it takes for a drop of blood to soak into a piece of blotting paper. The stiffer the blood cells, the longer it takes. So the other method we use is that we force a suspension of blood cells through a plastic filter whose holes are five thousandths of a millimeter. Now, that happens to be the same size as the capillaries in bone marrow. And, of course, if the blood takes a long time to filter through, it's because the holes in the capillaries are blocking up. And presumably, the same thing is happening inside the diver's body.